Now, the most common question I get is, where the heck do you get the stuff you sell? I never see it out there. How the heck are you finding it? Today, I'm going to tell you the steps I took to get to where I'm at and to be able to find these items. Hey, Don here. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about sourcing. Where do I get the items that I sell? It's one of the biggest questions. It's underneath tons of my videos. The kids are checking on feed or anything else like that. They point them out all the time. It's one of the biggest things that's a constant repeating question I get. Now, again, I've said this before. There's nothing special about me. Every single thing that I have up was available to somebody else at some point. I was just the one who saw the value, sourced it out, hunted it down, and found it. That's the only difference. Everybody else out there in my area has had the exact same abilities to find all the stuff that I get. A lot of people assume the stuff that I get, the stuff that I sell, isn't worth much when they see it out in the wild. And that's another huge aspect on why I'm able to get this stuff. Now, I did clothing for a very, very long time. We did books and the whole works. Clothing is a rat race in my mind. It has been, it, it was a, a means to an end. It was a way to get me in there and get a lot more revenue coming in to invest it in stuff that I could do better in, that I wouldn't have the returns, wouldn't have all the other issues in it. Uh, the clothing, again, I, I hated selling clothing. Takes far more time than anything I got. Probably eight, ten times as long to list one piece of clothing, photo and all that stuff, than it would ever be to list the majority of what we sell these days. I didn't pick what I sell. You know I sell a lot of postcards. I sell a lot of paper, trade cards. Um, geez, you name it, I sell it. But it's mostly all vintage. A lot of it's paper, old photos, military photos, movie-related items, posters, um, just all sorts of things, vintage toys, all that kind of stuff. Now, I hear the question again, where do you find it? I never see that stuff out in the wild. If you're going to thrift stores, specifically in garage sales, the majority of those are not going to have what I sell, the vast majority. Thrift stores, especially these days. In my area, if it's a thrift store, all of the better stuff, if they know it's a vintage toy, it's going to their online auction. End of story. You'll never see it in the store, ever. The stores these days, at least the Goodwill specifically around here, there's hardly anything in there anymore. It's all just pretty much the, the picked over, picked over, picked over stuff. And that's what it seems like. And it doesn't matter when you go. I've checked it out many different days, just been out and about and stopped in. I, I don't even really walk away with anything unless it's something I'm going to personally use these days. And I'd rather get it somewhere else anyway. Uh, Savers closed down around here. They never got anything good anyway at, at the end of the, their run here. But both of them have closed. The little mom paws are done. The ones that are still around just sell high priced junk basically as well. Too. Not all of them. There's a few here, a few there. Even if you were buying clothing from our local thrift stores and trying to resell that, you'd be buying the low-end clothing, again, because they send that over to auctions as well. That's the state of affairs here. Now, I don't go to those types of places anymore unless it's just for fun or, you know, to check the market out in general. I don't ever expect to find something at a thrift store anymore at all these days. Five years ago, maybe 10 years, most definitely. Like for us, if I'm going to want to sort and find, you know, mass quantities of paper, you got to go somewhere where there's going to be mass quantities of paper. Before I got pickers, and that's where a large chunk of my stuff comes from is pickers, it was estate sales. My pickers go to estate sales. So all I did was source out what I used to do with, you know, these folks who do it as well. I would go to some garage sales, but very specific ones. If they didn't list or have, you know, vintage or collectibles to begin with, I wouldn't even waste my time. Um, I wanted the old stuff. I didn't worry about clothing and stuff like that. So if you're just randomly bopping around to garage sales, for an example, you're not going to be effective finding the vintage stuff. And also when I, when I would go to a garage sale, I haven't went to one in I don't know how long, but I would pick certain neighborhoods that would have older stuff in it. I go to the old west end of town for a garage sale. Um, that's the place where they're not going to see a big value and stuff like that. So even if you are going to do garage sales, you have to pick the right neighborhoods, the right places that are going to have old stuff. To them, it's just a pile of old junk, old paper, whatever the case may be. 
that's where the stuff shows up at. I don't hit them in newer neighborhoods hardly ever. Not saying there wouldn't be some opportunity at garage sale, but usually I don't waste my time. My number one source was flea markets, especially the ones that vendors set up you know, on a weekly basis and don't have booths because they're always bringing new stuff in. So when I didn't have pickers, these are the sources that I used. And these are the same sources right now that my pickers use. They just go to more of them than I ever did so they can get more stuff for us. But the flea markets were pretty good. You can run into vendors there that might have some similar items to what you're looking for. And you can ask, you know, hey, you ever get this? You ever get that? I did a ton of questions. I did a ton of, hey, do you have this? To every vendor that had anything vintage. I had cards that I would hand out as well. Call me. I'll pay you more. If, if you steer stuff in my direction, I'll give you a finder's fee as well. Even if I don't buy it from you, I'll still give you the finder's fee. You know, so you're giving somebody something, a reason to call you over everybody else. Not only that, every single time I came back until they started to call me, I would constantly ask them again. Every time I walked through, hey, 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 what you got? What you got? What you got? You got this? You got that? That's the flea market, guys. Garage sales, again, we already talked about picking specific neighborhoods. I also didn't waste my time just randomly driving around. I always drew a route out before I ever left the house, and I still do that to this day. Maximize your time every which way you can. Every which way you can. Estate sales, though, was one of my prime hunting grounds for everything. And again, with estate sales, just like garage sales, if you're not picking the right neighborhood, you could be wasting your time going to them, especially if they don't list the stuff that I, I buy. A lot of the sales that, that I go to, a lot of the items I would be buying are just junk to them. So they don't highlight them. Records, they usually state, sometimes postcards. Sometimes they don't even list that they've got 10,000 magazines. Vintage periodicals they might list it as, or bunches of old uh, printed material you might see in an ad or something like that. If it's an estate sale, it's a business. And I just pick up that phone there and say, hey, what do you got? Ask them. If they don't give you a response right away, you keep calling back and ask before you go to that sale. I don't go to a place unless I have a potential for it. Another thing you'll find out if you're doing estate sales is that certain estate sale companies do certain types of estates. Certain neighborhoods I do far better in. I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, old soul music, northern soul it's called in some areas. So I pick neighborhoods that I'll turn that up in because I can get far more money from a 45 soul record than I can most anything else. That's, that's my game. That's the areas that I love shopping in and stuff like that. I like the music. I love the discs. So that's one of the areas I would always go to for an estate sale. Um record collectors, photo collectors, military. Now, sometimes if you're thinking about which estate sale should I go to, what I do, I figure out who owned the house, and you can find those records online, and I'll see what they used to do as a business. If they were in the military, I'm going to that sale. Usually you'll see uh, the obituary in the paper, and it'll say such and such was, you know, member of the armed services for 50 years, whatever. Those are the ones you're going to find that maybe have military relics they brought back from wars. Those are the ones that are going to have bayonets and cool stuff like that, uniforms, buttons, for an example. So I look for stuff like that. Maybe it's a teacher. There's tons of items that teachers actually would have in their possession, especially if they were a teacher for many, many years. So that's another one. Was the person uh, head of a scrapbooking organization or something like that? Another one. A lot of the paper I find, sometimes it's found at crafter sales and scrapbooking sales. State sales is the same basic principle. Where did they work? Did they work at a soda plant as a director of transportation for 40 years? Those are the ones I'm going to find soda shop signs at. Um, toy collector club or something. Chances are I'll find toys scattered out throughout the estate sale. So we eliminate a lot just by looking at certain aspects like that. You're not just going to see it in the paper. You're going to have to hunt down the information. But 95% of the time, I can track down enough information to decide which estate sale I should go to versus another one. Many times there'll be, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine on the very same day. Sometimes there's even been more around here. And you've got to hit the right ones. Some of them will have uh, certain types of people who are running it that don't know this or know this more than other ones. So I weigh those options too. This one estate sale company here, all their paper is super high. So I don't mess with them anymore. This other one over here doesn't know the pricing and they're usually really low. They'll have toys that they don't know. So they'll, they'll be cheaper marked. Those are reasons why I'll pick one over another one. Reasons why I find better stuff that, that I sell versus somebody else. 
a lot of people go to them and they look for like expensive clothing or or households or furniture or whatever the case may be that's that's not my concern a lot of them too you can get pictures ahead of time from their site so you can kind of see i don't go for the fancy well decorated houses i don't go for the ones where everything looks like it has a specific spot and it has to be there because those aren't the folks that are going to have boxes of just junk sitting around in the attic or in the basement that have never been cleared out again judge it by photos if you've got that opportunity those are key places and not only that most of the estates that i would go to around here i can buy bulk they'll have a box of postcards maybe a thousand postcards sitting on a table they've priced them individually sometimes or you'll just see a little sticker that says all postcards a dollar two dollars whatever they are if you offer them some and there's some good stuff in there i can walk away with a whole box of them very very reasonably Again, it goes for all sorts of different things. Those are great sources, the ones we've just talked about there. Flea markets, as I've said, same basic principle. I ask around. I go to the ones that I know have vintage stuff. If, if there's 20 flea markets within, a, say, a 30-minute uh, drive from us, I've figured out which ones from trial and error I find stuff at. If it's a junk or a flea market that's mostly new and just secondhand junk, I write that down and I don't go back there anymore. You know, and if I find like uh, antique malls, you can make a ton of money and still buy bulk from an antique mall, believe it or not. The antique malls around here, there's probably a dozen or so that are okay. There's three that are awesome that anytime I walk in there, I can make a lot of money. Anytime. So I only go to those three anymore and I can hit them really quickly in, in you know, one, one small span. I can drive from one to the other to the other. Got my routes already set. I know where I'm going. Now, these are places too some of my pickers sell at. A couple of my pickers are flea market guys, as well as they have booths in antique malls. So I've just cut out the middle person in some aspects in some of these. And I've met them at flea markets. They call me when they get something in. So a lot of times with certain folks, you won't find stuff in specific antique malls because they might be picking them for somebody else. Those are the biggest places you're going to get stuff. Now, I've done the Craigslist ads. Um, I've looked on Facebook for, you know, stuff for sale. 95, 98% of everything I see on Facebook and Craigslist here is from somebody else who's a reseller trying to get somebody else to buy it from them. The record bunches I go through around here, I might see them three different times. I might have bought them originally from the original owner, put them up at auction. Somebody else buys them, picks out what they think's good, and then they go up on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. Somebody else may buy them. Again, then I'll get a call. Hey, come look. I got a whole bunch of records. And it turns out it's stuff I've already looked at. So for me, there's it's it's a waste of time, 95% of the time, messing with Craigslist or Facebook to buy from. Very, very rarely. Now, on that note, though, you can use uh, uh, Craigslist for a place to post ads and articles. You can do that in your local newspaper, too. It's more expensive than the local newspaper. But with, with Craigslist, you can say, I buy this. I buy that. You can put a list up there. You can keep renewing it and run it 24-7 that you'll buy this stuff from them and pay cash. Now, I wouldn't do that unless you're going to meet them at, say, the police department in the parking lot. Here I can meet them at a police department in their parking lot right in front of the building. There's always somebody in daytime hours in the office in there. So that's what I would do if I meet somebody like that. Now, I do have ads out there. I do have people that call me. Now, if you find a bunch of stuff and you've done estate sales for years like, like me, you're going to get to be friendly with some of the estate sale companies. So they're going to get stuff in that may, they may not deem as worth throwing on the floor or that they would just be fine selling straight out to get rid of it in mass bulk. So those are options to buy stuff in bulk, estate sale companies for that reason. But get on all their lists. Have them call you when they're running sales. Always show up. Always be polite. Always talk to them. And every time I go there, until they remembered who I was, they're getting my card. Every single time, every single person there I can hand out, usually walked in with a bunch of them, so everybody would have my name all over the place. So what happens after a while? People start calling you. Hey, I got this. I got that. Why cut out the middleman? They throw a price out there, the same price it would be at the estate sale. You either buy it or you don't. A lot of times I could just walk out with a whole bunch of it. Again, that that's this is literally where I got to where I'm at and why I'm selling what I'm selling because I've done all of these steps here. Now, there's one more really good one that's been incredibly good for us, and that is 
live auctions. The ones that sell the vintage and the antiques. Around here, there's probably five or six every two weeks about. So 10 or so a month, there's probably ones that I could go to around here that are, that are okay. Probably about four that are really good if I want to hang out and stuff at them. Now around here, and around most areas where I've been to live auctions, antique ones, again, we're talking collectibles in, in, in antique auctions. You can find them online. What's it, uh, Auction Zip or something like that online, I think it's called. I've got it saved on my, my laptops, but I know which ones to go to as well. I figured out which ones have the best stuff. Most of the live auctions around here post sometimes a couple hundred pictures. So you can get an idea overall at what's at one of these places. And if they don't have a picture of something, what do I do again? I get out the phone and I call them. Same thing goes for an antique mall. Um, any place I could possibly go to, I can call most of them as long as it's not like a garage sale or something like that. State sale companies have phone numbers as well. Ask them what's up there. What do they have? Do they have this? Do they have that? You can offer to buy stuff if they, they don't think it's worth something. All the junk paper at the end, whatever the case may be. Those are all options I've used to buy bulk every time. Um, but at the local live auctions, you'll see all kinds of stuff. Most of the high dollar, high value stuff goes for sale in the beginning of the auction when everybody's there and everybody has money. That's the ploy every single auctioneer I know does. All the good stuff goes in the beginning when there's more people there. It'll p peter out once some of the higher value stuff goes because a lot of the people were there for a small limited number of things. So if you stay through the end, usually at the end, there'll be a bunch of stuff that didn't sell. And what happens is they'll do table cleanup. Everything sells at some auctions I go to. At the end of the day, if it goes to a table lot, if nobody buys at the table lot, you might see it thrown in a box lot at the end of another auction sometime in the near future. I bought entire tables worth of stuff for five and 10 bucks. I'm talking hundreds of items. And in some cases, thousands of stuff on a table that most people thought is just junk. It sat there, it didn't sell or it didn't sell for what they wanted. And they blew it out at the end of the day. That's a good way to buy bulk of stuff. You can go to sales and buy them in bulk to begin with. Some of the sales I bought boxes and crates of postcards bidding against other people. But again, they were available there. All those places I just mentioned are, are where all the stuff I get pretty much comes from. Whether it comes straight from me finding it or a picker that's doing exactly what I just said, it all it's all the same basic principle. Again, I'm not going to get the stuff I sell at Savers or Goodwill or Salvation Army or anything like that. It's not going to show up. Most of what I buy is not going to be found in a garage sale. You've got to go to places that are selling vintage items. Again, if you don't know a whole bunch about stuff, start off small. Postcards are probably the easiest thing to get into. You're going to have to look up a lot. It's going to be an investment in time. Just like clothing. Most people forget who have been selling clothing for a very long time that it took you a while to realize what was the best clothing to buy, price structure, making sure there's no holes or things that you might miss. So everything has a huge learning curve when it comes to reselling. So you just forgot about it now if you've been a clothing seller for three or four years. You know how to find the clothing because you've been invested in that for a long time. You're going to have to get off the mode of thinking of stuff in the way of the clothing seller versus the vintage and the collectible seller. For me, I do so much better than I ever did selling clothing, selling this stuff. And value-wise, my per item sales average is far higher, two, three, four times higher most all the time than any time I ever did clothing in the history of me doing clothing. So it's a huge difference in value for what I sell. The money's there, it's easy to store, easy to sell, and for me, it's super easy to find. There, there again, there is no trick. I don't have any magic eight ball that I can shake or rub or turn upside down and look at for it to tell me, hey, the stuff's going to be over there. All the places I told you is how I got right here. And the same, same places I talk about is how I got my pickers as well. Now, I had to hunt down my pickers. Some of them are flea market guys. Some of them sell in, in antique malls. Some of them run estate sales. It's the same type of people. They don't necessarily like doing online selling. A lot of people out there are getting fed up with it as it is. They don't want to mess with the computers. They see cash in hand. They can flip it quick. That's why they do it this way. That's why they just sell it. A lot of these are old timers. They've been doing flea markets and selling at sale places like that for decades. It's, it's in their blood. It's what they love. I am just happen to be an internet guy, so for me it worked out fine. I take over the stuff from them. They make a pretty darn good penny. I just happen to buy it in bulk from certain people as well because they don't have room to store it either. All their money comes from the more expensive stuff, so they don't mind blowing out 
400 postcards for 75 bucks, 100 bucks, even 200 bucks. To them, that's easy money. It's just a box that they don't have to sink a darn dime of time into, expense or list or scan or anything else. We've got it all set up where that's easy for us. So for me, it's a win-win for me and a win-win for them because they're still making really good money. Even if I make hundreds of dollars off some things, they're making hundreds and hundreds of dollars off it as well. Otherwise, they wouldn't sell it to me for so cheap. But that's the breakdown. That's all there is to it. Digging in and going to the right places. And if you live near a decent sized town, you can do exactly the same steps that I do. There's, I'm sure, estate sale companies all over the place. I'm sure there's flea markets. I'm sure there's antique malls. All these same options are there for you. Local live auctions, again, are huge, huge places where you can get massive bulk. If I go to a, a local live auction, I'm walking out of there with hundreds of individual auctions worth of items. So anyway, that's what I have for you today. Hopefully that gave you some ideas, some thoughts. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button down below. You can also hit the bell icon to be notified if I post new content or go live. Subscribe and tell all your friends. just by looking at her? Sure. Her hands give her away. After a lot of housework, her hands don't look so feminine, especially around the knuckles. Well, I like that. Come here, look at this. What? Oh, her ear. <laughs> What's wrong with these knuckles? Hey, you must be different. These are much too smooth to be married hands. Very pretty, feminine hands. You know, I think that's because I do dishes with new, clear joy. Look at this. I can see right through it. So you can see how mild it is. Well, you mean clearness means mildness? Well, it certainly seems to with joy. Still think you can tell by her hands if a girl's married? Sure you can. I mean, if she's wearing a wedding ring. Oh. On the hand, the joy keeps so feminine looking. <laughs>